Hey everybody, I'm Stephanie Halverson. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the Division Chief at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, we have both an academic hospital medicine division of about uh, 35 physicians and five APPs. And then I also oversee a smaller community hospital with a group of approximately 13 physicians. I'm Chad Bocoon. I'm at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Nebraska Medicine is our health system. We have uh, 48 hospitalists. We cover um, about 35% of all the inpatients at our large 700-bed uh, uh, teaching hospital, as well as a 45-bed community hospital in a suburb of Omaha. Um, and we cover both of those with the FTE I described. So we wanted to just start out by saying thank you for joining us. I'm sure you're just as busy um, as we are. This is a really busy time for all of us. Um, we wanted to share a little bit about where we're at in our own journeys and then um, provide some um, leadership wisdom, I hope, that we've gained so far. But I'm going to be quick to tell you neither one of us would claim ourselves as experts. Um, we are actually hoping to learn from you also during the Q&A period. Um, but we've been in communication with other hospitalist leaders in our area and through SHM, and so hope that what we talk about today isn't just um, guidance from us, but kind of collective guidance from articles and colleagues that we know. Um, I thought I would just start by mentioning kind of where we're at with uh, the pandemic in Oregon. Um, there are about 600 cases in our state right now. We're the only academic medical center in the state, um, but still we have had only a few, a handful. We have currently eight inpatients with COVID. Um, we have been in the very uh, active and aggressive planning phase uh, for the surge that we anticipate is coming, particularly as we're flanked by Washington and California, who've both seen much more significant epidemics. So we are um, probably even a little bit behind that aspect. We have 210 positive cases in Nebraska. Um, we, have, we have nine inpatients uh, currently with COVID positive. We've been very... Um, busy with, with rule out and really kind of ramped up our COVID unit. We have a little bit of an interesting perspective, however, as we have a biocontainment unit and a, a Department of Defense quarantine area. So we actually took some of the early Princess Cruise Line patients um, from, uh, you know, we were one of, I think, three or four spots that had a number of those. We did have positive patients uh, about a month ago and also a large number of uh, repatriate uh, folks that came to a National Guard area in Omaha. So the city has been ramping up for quite a while, actually, and I think that's helped us a little bit. I um, mean, it was interesting that uh, we used our biocontainment unit, which only holds four beds, and so we quickly, when things started to ramp up, had to switch out. But I did get a little bit of a feel for what things were going to be like with that early exposure. Thanks, Chad. Um, so. I've been relying on some of um, the leadership wisdom I've learned along the way, and this quote has really stuck with me in the last few weeks, um, now more than ever, that leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. And I feel like we're all really being called on to do it um, right now. And part of that gets at what are some of the current leadership challenges we're experiencing? And again, this isn't just our list. This is generated from others that we know. but I'm guessing you may have others that you would add to this list. First of all, the volume of information that is coming out both through medical societies, um, journals, our own hospitals, the lay press, the news, all of that is leading to just an unbelievable fire hydrant worth of information. And keeping up, um, yesterday I was getting about 200 emails per day and that's where I'm at right now. And it's just really hard to keep up with the volume. The other thing I mentioned, of course, the sources of information are difficult. Um, they're coming not just uh, through our medical communities, but through our neighbors and friends and loved ones who all have questions and input about information that they've learned. And of course, the pace of information is changing rapidly. This is a really um, conniving infection uh, so far. Everything that we've learned about the stereotypic presentation, I think, um, has already been shattered by some of the cases we've seen. Some of the patients are younger uh, than we expected. Some of them don't have um, immunocompromising states or severe medical illnesses. Um, and some of them ha clearly have no obvious exposures. 
We're going to talk a lot about anxiety, um, but uh, specifically, but I would uh, be remiss to not mention it here as one of the significant challenges, and we'll talk more about it. Um, there's anxiety not just among physicians, but everyone that you interact with in the hospital, and of course, everyone you interact with in the rest of your life, too. Some of the other challenges we've experienced um, at OHSU, and I'm guessing you are too, is some new organizational structures. We, we are in a modified operations incident command phase right now, which means we all have new roles and responsibilities. I'm actually serving as the medical director for the medical branch this week, um, which is separate and in addition to my hospital hospitalist leader role. So many of you may be experiencing that too. A couple of the other challenges that I wanted to mention, um, misinformation has been a problem, both because of the pace and the fact that it's on social media and uh, there's so much information coming in. We have had uh, times when misinformation made it into our hospitalist group. And so we'll talk about how to kind of address that later, um, but that might be rumor, anecdotes, even if it's fact, um, but not, not uh, contextualized properly, it can be really, difficult to manage. And then coordination of work. Um, now more than ever, I think we need to be outside of our silos as we plan for acute care surge staffing or some of you are farther along and already well into that. You're relying on people outside your usual work areas and that can result in difficulties with communication um, and knowing who to talk to. Yeah, what's interesting when Stephanie and I were comparing notes, we, we came up with very, very similar lists, and as we've uh, we've both reached out to a couple other leader colleagues or peers of ours, and the and the list is similar. So I think these things kind of stem regardless of where you are geographically. So um, you know, I think a, a a change and a challenge has also been the workforce changes. So as our operating rooms have ramped down, as our um, you know real proceduralists have ramped down, they they want to help and they're looking for places that they can help, and that's been you know, challenging both as a, um, a little bit arrogant that I think hospitalists are the best people to take care of these patients, but we also need need help and we need spots filled and such. I think we can't underestimate the, the family obligations with uh, school cancellations, daycare. I was talking to a nurse today and they've had three uh, providers like daycare or nanny providers uh, quit on them this week because she works at a place where there's COVID-19 positive patients and so they won't come and care for her first grader and third grader. Um, you know, I think any of us with kids are running the stress of being a, a principal of an elementary or middle school as well as trying to do your job. And then also physician partners. So um, everybody's got the struggles. My struggle has been my wife it runs our molecular genetics lab and she was doing all of our testing. So for the first couple weeks that this was ramping up we were we were crazy and people were like you two are really important and we're like I wish I was a little less important this week to be honest um, I don't think we can underestimate the atmosphere so we've I've had multiple meetings with the emergency department and just getting to the gist of how much pressure patients are putting on emergency physicians to be admitted I think if they watch even a minute of the news they assume that this is a you know an incredibly deadly disease and they want to admit it even if they're stable and, uh, and on oxygen and so we've um, you know really we've addressed that and we've created I'll, I'll talk a little bit later but we've created a callback system for that and then testing has been challenging um, although we have maybe been a little better off in some places at early testing now as it's becoming more more widespread that people want testing kind of for for the community it's been really challenging and i think that's been the case all over so these are all challenges that i think cross borders for sure so i mentioned anxiety um we have leadership challenges and then surrounding all of that is so much anxiety not just in the community around us but within us and I just wanted to add this slide because I think as leaders, it's okay and probably really important that we think about our own anxiety and fear and acknowledge that it's real and it's for good reason. You know, this is a disease that, you know, as you put it on paper, it's, it's quite frightening. It's deadly. It spreads easily. You don't know who has it, who doesn't. And by the way, we don't have enough test supplies or PPE to protect ourselves. I learned today that we are, um, have a shortage of hand sanitizer. Um, you know, we don't typically operate in a resource scarce environment. So this has led to just new forms of anxiety. 
I really appreciated the um, quote that came to me on a different listserv um, from a hospitalist who said, uh, who shared a dream that he or she had. It says, those who know me well know I have just a tinge of claustrophobia, but not so bad. But there I was in the middle of my dream. I was in a New York City hospital and I had COVID. I was febrile. I couldn't breathe, literally gasping for breath. And there was the MICU doctor rushing at me with a syringe for sedation in his left hand and a ventilator tube in his right. There I said it. I'm kind of scared of COVID. I really appreciated this because I don't think we talk about this as physicians almost ever or, or other healthcare providers, but fear is real and it's okay to have it. But that doesn't mean, um, I think it's important to address it and then figure out how do you lead even when anxiety and fear is present. And so what we wanted to do now is share with you some pearls that we came up with together that have been helpful to us in managing um, through this difficult time. And again, at the end, if you have other pearls you'd like to share with the group, we would welcome them. Great. Yeah, I think that that anxiety component has definitely been in our group and, and managing that and acknowledging that is so important. So the first one I want to talk about is, is one that, you know, if you take a leadership course, you're going to get this, but it's never been more poignant than, than this last few weeks is you have to know your style and you have to have a, a multimodal approach to planning. So I'm more of a go to a unit and get hands on and kind of get going, but there's so many ways to do it as far as coming up with new policies, new procedures, having a workflow document, you know, where to, where to collate all the information Stephanie was talking about earlier and, and what is the best practice. I've never talked to my ID docs and infection control more than I have in the last 10 days. And, um, you know, I didn't even have some of their cell phones because it just wasn't a, a real need and kind of getting all that. Then how do you get that out? And we're going to talk a little bit about a system of communication on the next slide, but that dissemination has to also be multimodal. You can't just rely on what you need. You have to get it out in, in many different ways. And, um, you know, just really thinking about all the people who you're uh, reporting to and reporting for and how to, how to best, you know, speak up to leadership, but also get information out to those who work, work with you. This quote I thought was, was really uh, poignant that the, the quality of a leader is, is in, reflected in the standards they set for themselves. And, Actually, when we opened our COVID unit, I, I took the first week. It made some of our uh, younger hospitalists nervous. They wondered if I still remembered how to actually take care of patients. But <laughs> I took it to work out the kinks and iron out the, the you know trouble spots. And I, I really do think that has paid off, given me a little bit of uh, um, emotional bank deposits. So um, developing a system of communication is probably more important now than ever. Um, again, going back to just the massive influx of information and, and exerting some control over that. And I would suggest that we all do that and think about how to sort of control the information within our groups. So these are some recommendations that we've uh, implemented. And again, I'm sure you may have others. Um, for my group, we send a single daily leadership email. Um, hospital leadership also sends one, and we send a separate one that addresses the issues that came up during our huddle that day for people that weren't on the huddle. Um, so far, I've found the uptake has actually been really good. I think people are anxious and concerned, and so reading their email more. Um, but I wouldn't suggest that email be the only way of communicating with people. Um, we've also implemented a group chat. Um, we use WhatsApp. I know some other groups have used Yammer. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's other options out there, and I should say we have no disclosures and receive no funding from any of these sites. Um, we actually implemented two in my group. We have two WhatsApp channels. One is our emergency communication channel, and it's only open, um, and fortunately we haven't had to use it yet, but for severe staffing shortage where we need volunteers that haven't been covered through our backup system or some other um, urgent need for communication. The other one is social, and I'll show you some examples from that in a minute. That has been wonderful and a great place for people to just kind of share um, stories, anecdotes, photos, memes, things like that. The thing I'm most pleased about and that has been something I think we will continue even after this crisis is over is we have a daily huddle um, and that's it's virtual. 
I would say we didn't used to have a daily huddle structure. Many of you probably have already um, incorporated that. But um, I really appreciate this now because I can see people's faces. Um, and I'm going to show you a screenshot of our new best friend. This is a screenshot of my group from yesterday's huddle. They were kind enough to smile for the camera. Um, as you can see, some of them have discovered how to put custom backgrounds behind their photos, including a giant roll of toilet paper in the lower left corner, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, but going back to um, why that's important is because when people ask questions, um, it's really important to unpack the rationale behind it. And just being able to see somebody's face and realize um, what they're ner that they're nervous and not angry, for example, is really, really helpful. So that's been something I've really enjoyed. Um, and then the single source of information and um, Chad, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I think you've you've said it well that if it doesn't come from you. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to that on on the kind of data over drama as well. But you yeah. know, we we really kind of funnel everyone to our SharePoint site. And if it's not on there, then it's not been vetted by hospital medicine leadership. And um, I'll tell you, we'll talk a little bit about Stephanie and I's kind of peer support of each other, but I totally stole her her virtual daily huddle and we're kicking that off tomorrow for our first one. And it, I, my team was so excited. I, I gave Stephanie no credit for it. I, I should have thought it up on my <laughs> Thanks own, a lot. But yeah, <laughs> no, I gave her full credit, but I think it's something that just that communication is so key. So um, the next pearl that we came up with is um, it's important to establish a chain of command. And at least in my group, that's not really how we normally operate. Although I'm the division chief, we're pretty relaxed around here. This is Oregon. Things are pretty informal. Um, but what we did is really established a chain of command, um, both within our division and outside of our division. There is an external incident command structure that I mentioned, and I had to learn it um, and know where I fit in that. And then I had to designate within my group who needs to do what. And so I, I uh, identified, we have several medical directors, but one of them became um, the assistant division chief uh, for right now. And he is in charge of all of our acute care planning. Um, and he is, uh, knows that I need to approve pretty much everything that goes out, which is not, again, the way that I normally operate. But again, it's to make sure that all of these different threads of communication that are coming into our division from so many places, that we funnel it all through one place. Um, and I'm sure there are many examples of how to do um, kind of a hierarchical command structure or chain of command. Um, the one we have is just, it's um, three layers deep. Yeah, I think that is so important and even figuring out who from infectious disease infection control is kind of in charge and who from hospital staffing is in charge. And, you know, it, it, it was both uh, wonderful and frightening when about six weeks ago I said, you know, who, who exactly is in charge of staffing for inpatient? I said, there's a lot of assumptions and questions. And the response I got back was, well, we assumed you were. And so I took that and that's been great because we've got to create our own system, but it, that chain of command I think was really important. The next pearl is is data over drama. And I'm sure all of you have, have stories about this. And you know, I, I joke that our hospital is nothing more than a small town and rumors can really, you know, go quickly and when there's rapidly exchanging information in an anxious time, the you know fire really can break out. I think if you hear of any um, of your own hospitalists or, or your own you know folks spreading any of this mis misinformation, I think it's very important to get to them privately. And there's probably something behind that, like they're concerned about something or they're, maybe their anxiety. I think it's really important to correct misinformation that's gone out publicly. Um, I've had six or seven of these even this week, like what to do with periop and procedure testing and what to do with, uh, you know, we're, we, they put a tent outside of our emergency room and they didn't necessarily advertise why that was and people started to really kind of panic. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a great time for that stimulus to response. So really letting things set before you fire off a, a reply email. But I think getting that correct answer, and I, I truly have gone to our ID docs, I've gone to our critical care docs, I've really gotten all this square. 
And this is where Stephanie's point from earlier is I, I basically said to my team on Friday, if it doesn't come from me or if it doesn't come from, from my operations director, it is not true. And we may not know the answer right away, but we'll find it and then we'll get the, we'll get the answer back out. But don't take action on the rumor or on something else that has come up unless it's been vetted through us. And that is not normally how I operate either. But I think for this, with the anxiety involved, I think it's just really, really important to get their drama out of it as best you can. Thanks, Chad. Um, related to that, uh, leadership pearl number five is ask how people are doing. Um, there's the general, hey, how's everybody doing? Um, but I don't find that's very high yield. What I did on our Zoom call the other day is I just asked, what are you worried about? And then I was silent and people started pouring out their concerns, concerns about their family, that they're gonna bring home infection, um, worried about pre-existing illnesses and that they might get sick. Um, it was really, even though I couldn't solve all of their worries, I think just being able to share them among the group was in itself therapeutic. Um, and then I will say, Chad is better about this than I am, but going to see people where they're working, bring donuts, buy coffee, do things to just let them know, especially if they're on a COVID unit and they're feeling isolated and alone, checking in with those people and making sure they're doing okay is really important. Yeah, we even have um, our director of, of patient and provider experience is one of our hospitalists and she's partnered with uh, some of our psychiatrists and she's actually holding these hour long forums. And it really is just good advice. And, and if nothing else, letting people you know, acknowledge their anxieties. They do some some uh, kind of deep breathing exercises and really just acknowledge that this is a scary time. It's not just scary because of the disease. It's scary for society and it's scary for you know our economy and all these other things. And I think if if you haven't stood those up, and I bet most of you have, I think if you've got a, a an advocate that could do something like that, because again, it's a multimodal approach. Um, anybody that knows me i'm not a big meditation guy but some are and and you know i think that's that's one thing you got to look at and I, and I really do think like stephanie said going out and just checking on the 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 teams face to face has really helped uh, we have a universal masking policy now and uh, it makes it it makes you even more isolated you know and um i probably look better with a mask on but nonetheless <laughs> i think it's good to go out and, and see people for sure um, so this is one that that I mean, just truly out of serendipity, uh, Stephanie and I created a, uh, in December as we both ended up at a. We've known each other for a few years, but had not been in super close contact, and we kind of agreed to start a weekly phone call. And I will tell you that um, even pre-COVID, this was one of the most important hours I spend in my uh, almost every week, and it's really helped with thinking about new ideas. I've, I've stolen and borrowed lots of things that OHSU is doing. And I think um, I've got Stephanie in contact with some of our people for, you know, ways to do it. We decompress. I mean, we actually were texting earlier <laughs> in the day about some things that have happened and it just makes us both feel a little bit better about things that maybe don't go awesome all the time. And then, you know, nobody knows my challenges more than a peer. You know, the the, the surgery section chief for, for transplant doesn't know what, what it's like, but but you know, talking to Stephanie on a weekly basis really helps with those those challenges. So if you don't have somebody like that, you know, nobody can have her. I already have Stephanie. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think we do have bandwidth that both of us would absolutely be available for other phone calls, but find somebody and I highly recommend it. I can't agree with that more. And I've been really thankful too in my immediate community, the hospitalist directors of two other large um, community hospital systems in town have reached out and we've started talking once uh, once a week too. And um, that's been really important too. You know, as Chad says, our hospitals are small towns. And when we went to the universal masking policy, I knew that their hospitals hadn't. So I gave them the heads up the day before so that they would know and be able to manage that within their own groups. Um, so if you don't know the hospitalist leaders in your community, now's a great time to reach out to them. Yeah, I was talking to the director of hospital medicine at our children's hospital, and we have um, four MedPeds hospitalists that they spend half their time at children's and half their time with us. And he was just asking how things were going. He was asking a couple questions about our COVID unit and our testing and PPE. 
he goes, I want to tell you, I, I went to our hospital leadership earlier today and I said, uh, I think the med peds folks need are needed much more across town than here. And so he released them of their children's duties for the next quarter and is still going to pay their portion of their salary, but he basically freed them up for us to use. And I think that was just so amazing. And actually the med peds folks were excited because it was, you know, they, they were feeling torn because the children's spot just isn't quite as busy. So that was another example of finding a peer. That's great. This one I won't dwell on, but I mentioned we have a social uh, media channel or social chat channel, and um, some of the memes that are coming through are hilarious and <laughs> maybe inappropriate, but um, they made me laugh out loud. And laughing right now is medicine. So use your own judgment about what's appropriate to share, but these two made me laugh um, and consider that for your groups too. And uh, our, our final pearl here is, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we instill confidence more than anything. And I, I have said this, this has kind of become my mantra is we are ready. And when I signed off our planning meeting last week, I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into this, this battle with any other team. And um, I'm a former football player and kind of a meathead at baseline. So some of them just kind of expect that for me, but I, I, I think it's it's so important and I've said it over and over again and it's actually started to kind of repeat itself within the hospital and it's actually instilled more confidence in the hospital medicine group from other leaders and such and I think in that you know you can cheerlead but you also have to listen to concerns I think it's been extremely important for us to talk about the families the sleep a lot of folks have been having trouble with sleep that physical resilience I'm really trying to get more people onto my team and my rotations from outside of hospital medicine so that I protect my team from themselves. You know, if I have, if I open up all my shifts, my hospitalists will sign up and then in a month they're going to all be exhausted. And so I'm trying to get some other residents onto our service and some other things uh, just to kind of help out and protect our folks. And then we found, both Stephanie and I found this uh, supporting clinicians during the COVID-19 pandemic to be something that I think is a must read for for anybody that's kind of going through this and probably a lot of you've already seen it but if you haven't I think it's worth a worth a view for sure. So we wanted to leave you with this slide um, another of my fa our favorite um, leadership quotes a leader is a dealer in hope and I know we started talking about anxiety, but I have a lot of optimism that we have the people and the tools and the um, wherewithal to get through this. And I say that not just like Chad does to my group, but to my community too. And I let them know we're gonna get through this. And I think that's really reassuring to people. Um, so I think at this point, we were asked to keep the slides down to about 30 minutes. I think we wanted to open it up um, for questions and discussions. I'll hand it back over to the moderator. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie and Chad, um, for sharing uh, what, uh, fantastic um, pearls of wisdom that you picked up along the way and crowdsourced from your peers. Um, I know this was really helpful, and 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 I will say that, um, you know, one of the things that FHM has been thinking a lot about is how to address some of that anxiety, and so I'm, we're really appreciative that you. Um, that you touched on that um, as part of uh, addressing the leadership needs in hospital medicine teams. Um, so I just want to remind uh, attendees that if they want to ask questions, they can do so by typing those into the question box, and we'll uh, get to as many questions as we possibly can. I know Stephanie and Chad were also interested in hearing, you know, if you have other um, pearls of wisdom that you feel would be helpful to share uh, with the broader audience. Um, please feel free to type those into the question box as well and, and we'll share them. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions and we'll start with, um, there was one question that was uh, a, a little bit more on the clinical side and, and maybe will be a little bit easier to answer. Um, just about cohorting PUIs and COVID positive patients. Are those uh, cohorted separately at your institution? Um, at our institution, COVID and PUI patients are cohorted on the same units for now. Um, but once they rule out, they're moved off of that unit. Yeah, we're the same way. We are, if they're definitely known positives coming in, we're 
tending to to try to keep those maybe on one side of the hallway but it's becoming even challenging at that and we have basically two floors in a, in one tower that are, are COVID units and they're cohorting together. But I agree with Stephanie, as soon as those tests come back, we're getting them out to the general population. And that's been a point that, that I've had to reemphasize to leadership a, a lot is we still need to run a regular hospital. We still need to keep our other towers and our other areas functioning for the general hospital group. And, and that's been something that we get, has gotten lost in the weeds a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions just coming in, so we'll try to get to them all. Uh, but you mentioned that you're using um, WhatsApp or other tools for uh, group communications. Um, how secure do you feel those tools are, and are you concerned about um, using sort of publicly available tools like that for work communications? That's a really good question, um, and I should have maybe thought to clarify that so we don't there's no patient information shared this way we have um, a secure text messaging through our um, our texting platform that we use for any patient related information so this is all non HIPAA um, non patient related but really just around kind of acute staffing needs so to that end, I'm not too concerned about um, privacy um, I have learned that I think Zoom does a fair amount of uh, acquiring your information. I don't know exactly what all while you're using it. And so um, I'm mindful of that. Um, we we pay for it. There's a free version too, but I, um, you know, I'm not really sophisticated in those matters, but I do think we need to be sensitive. Um, and I think, so I think it's a really good question. Yeah, and we've stuck to mostly the, the embedded parts of, of our, Kind of operating system for communication, but um, I, I think it's oh, it's never a bad thing to be sensitive about any of that privacy, the privacy issues. I, I, I'm not sure if um, you've confronted this problem, but would love to hear your perspective uh, regardless. But um, what are you doing about providers who are refusing to see COVID patients? We actually had. Um, a couple that were at least extremely anxious about it and you know I, I think it gets gets down to getting to the root of that anxiety and and also you know kind of getting back to information I, I have an extremely young faculty and so some of the some of them just you know they're still working on their confidence as a provider and their confidence and so you know after having discussed it with them and then also I think that part of of me like I, I was the first hospitalist to go in and see a, a COVID positive patient and I think that I, I talked about that and I told them I was nervous and they, they kind of you know I think acknowledging that and letting them know and then our ID folks have really said to tr you, we have to trust our PPE and I know there's shortages and we need to conserve but you have to trust that that you know that the types of protection we're taking are extremely important. Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add to that. I think um, we the um, the question came up this week about pregnancy, and right now our institution does not have a policy that prohibits pregnant uh, employees from working with COVID patients because um, you know there it's still a fair amount of unknown there. Um, we have, as a group, decided to remove pregnant pregnant hospitalists from COVID patient care because there are unknowns. But otherwise, I haven't had any outright refusals. Great. Another question um, that I, I know has been happening um, in some spots around the country, but um, uh, where the census is down, they're not at a surge yet. And so how do you coach your team when administration is asking um, to cut down shifts and to scale back, um, you know, sort of in anticipation of, of a future surge? That's a good question. That has come up at our community hospital. And um, actually, it was not so much an ask from administration, but we voluntarily implemented it for the group out there. There were a number of people who were willing. Um, you, you know, they have a shift quota for the year that they need to work, but I think they were fairly confident they would be able to make that up. Um, and our census has been very low, um, both at our community site and, I mean, I've never seen it this low at our academic site. We have a strict uh, stay-at-home policy in Oregon and people are being pretty good about it and so I don't know exactly 
if or how that's related to our low census, but um, but it is quite low. So we haven't addressed it on the uh, academic side, but on the community side, we are um, doing a voluntary um, shift reduction for those who are interested, and then just redistributing the patients. Yeah, and our, our census has been low as well. I've joked with a lot of people, maybe this will prove to Americans that they don't need to go to the emergency room for their <laughs> sprained ankle, but well, we can only hope. Um, we haven't reduced shifts either. We, we have said to folks, you know, maybe this is the time to rest up. And if you're done with your shift and you and everything's kind of tidied up, we're, you know, allowing people to kind of leave a little earlier. Um, I do know our children's hospital, I mentioned earlier, they are kind of in the midst of looking at shift reduction right now and such, but it, it is pretty, pretty crazy how that our census overall has been a lot lower. Another, uh, there was a couple questions around um, a sort of a broader existential question um, that we, I, I think we'd all be curious to hear your thoughts on. Um, uh, and, and this one actually came in from the director of uh, St. Charles in Bend, Oregon. So, uh, you know, a neighbor of yours. Just down the road. That's uh, right. Um, uh, but how do you inspire hope when you yourself may feel anxiety and worry? I am so glad you asked that question. Um, and Bend is actually going to be part of my answer, but I'll get to that in a second. Bend, Oregon. Um, I think the first thing, like I said, is just to acknowledge it. Um, if you're feeling frightened or down um, or not sleeping or anxious, I think the first thing is to acknowledge it. Um, the second is if you have someone that you see for either mental health or wellness, this is a time to use that person. A lot of them are doing virtual visits um, to kind of help you process just your own emotions. Um, the third thing is to really arm yourself with the science. Um, I find that going back and talking to infection control and infectious disease actually is really reassuring. For example, um, there was a question about should we be wearing masks in the hallways or, you know, you see people sort of afraid to breathe the same air as anybody else. And kind of reminding yourself that, you know, this isn't a matter of just walking past someone. You actually need to be in the same airspace for a prolonged period of time. Um, this isn't, you know, you don't need to be afraid to breathe the air around you. Um, and washing your hands is totally within your control and something that we should all be doing. And so kind of remembering what your levers of control are, and there are others, but those are just a couple, it makes it not feel quite so out of control. And then what I was gonna say about Bend, Oregon, for those of you that don't know, it's this beautiful, beautiful town in the center part of Oregon, and it's surrounded by mountains, um, and it's kind of high desert, and it's where I go on vacation when I need to get away. And so I've been in this mission control role now for three weeks, and it's seven days a week. And so I took a couple days off, although I was still doing six hours of email a day and I went to bend and I was just outside and I went running and I did the things that I do that help me relax and sleep better and got to spend time with my kids and my husband. Um, so I, again, I'm, and I'm not claiming any expertise, but I'm just sharing kind of what I do. I don't yeah. know, Chad. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love the acknowledgement and and sticking to the the science behind this. And then I've really tried to boost. Um, you know, I, I talk to my my neighbors a little bit at socially appropriate distances, but I am letting my six year old ride his bike outside and stuff. And I've just said I've repeated that we're ready because our city's scared too. You know, and um, the lay public is scared and. I've said we're ready and I've said this is what our university hospital exists for and this is why we are, you know, and, and it's it's kind of brought pride back to the profession a little bit, I think. Um, I've, I'm very limited in my podcast listening, but I listen to a couple of sports podcasts and their, their uh, acknowledgement and pride in, in healthcare workers is really, I don't think I've ever felt it this high. Um, you know, nurses, techs, you know, all of us going in each day knowing what we're facing. And I just try to embrace that and push that onto the team that, um, you know, th this is this is why we've, we've done our training and this is what we're meant for. A 
couple folks have shared some pearls, um, and I think this one is germane to just about all of us, including those of us on SHM staff. Uh, learning how to mute participants on web meetings and not depending on attendees to do it themselves. Uh, I think I think we're all in a place where we're adapting to new technologies um, that might be the pretty best rapidly. Problem. Yeah, all of us should implement that immediately. Yes. <laughs> Uh, another pearl um, that was shared um, was around caring, uh, caring for um, the families of the healthcare workers. And um, so at this uh, hospital, they closed their wellness center and opened it as a daycare center for children of any hospital employee who needed it. Mm -hmm. And they currently have 60 children there uh, for a hospital system that only has 100 active beds. Infants are cared for by the staff of the usual small daycare center and the wellness center employees, trainers, et cetera, run activities for the older children. This has been a huge help. If I can just so make it, one comment it, it on like, that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I love that so much. Uh, and at our institution, we, we also set up some childcare and additionally, the medical students who were forced off of their rotations banded together and like within days set up a system of offering child care for physicians and other healthcare workers and that kind of stuff is not only practically helpful it just it is it brings you so much joy and i think it's really there's so much of that i mean as i'm sitting here actually my neighbors are texting me and saying we're going to trader joe's can we bring you and your husband anything he's also a physician and the outpouring of just support and love from people um like soak that up really pay attention to those great moments because that also helps get you through. All right, back to the back to the difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I like the easy um, one. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question here that they reference um, that they've been out without an intensivist since uh, their PUIs and positive have been going up and the hospitalists have just been forced to manage. Um, they've asked their administration repeatedly for help, um, and until uh, they, the hospitalists refuse to do it anymore, we're unheard. Do you have any advice on how to communicate um, with administration the sort of the true needs and, and to get the message heard without, without taking, um, you know, pretty drastic action? I think that's, that's challenging and, um, you know, I, I, I feel for having to, to take that action. We've had, you know, I think just letting them know exactly what your needs are early, often, and, and you know, let them know you're not speaking from, from let them know how busy you are and everything you're doing to support, and then do take a firm stand. So I talked about staffing a little bit earlier, and we need help. We need some additional either house staff or faculty that have diminished clinic duties. We need some people to fill in and um, you know, I, I think I, I took a hard stance and I said, this is what has to happen for our coverage to protect my team. And, you know, that that some of the leadership quotes can get a little cheesy at time, but that's the time to really take that stand. And I think it sounds like that that director did what they had to do, drastic or not, to to get leadership to, to see that. Yeah, I don't. That's a really tough one. I I think the only thing I would add to that is, um, and it sounds like that's not the case here. I've taken the tact of don't assume leadership like the C-suite leaders truly understand the issues. They're so removed from what we do. They might think intensivist, hospitalist, whatever, they can do the same thing, but they don't know. And so sometimes it's your role as a leader to really paint the picture for them about what does this mean and how is this impacting our ability, for example, to care for our non-acute or non-critical care patients. Um, so I don't have any solutions, but I, I would say don't assume they really understand what the issue is. Can you talk a little bit about um, both of your roles as leaders um, are you still doing usual clinical responsibilities? Have you adjusted? Um, it sounds like uh, like many of us these days, you're both wearing multiple hats. Um, uh, but specifically the questioner asked, their group is small and 
um, they don't seem to have time because they're still uh, helping to share uh, the clinical burden. So, uh, you know, providing the sort of leadership and the high touch leadership um, might be challenging. Um, I do not get yeah. back my clinical uh, duties. I, I do have a, a enviable amount of protected time, I think, but like I'm on the teaching service in April for, for two weeks. And I actually think kind of, as I said before, I think it's valuable for to be out there and to, to show and kind of dig in. But man, you have to find time to make sure your group is organized and, and limited. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, that that's, that's a challenge that I, I feel is, you know, you, there, there's, there's personal wellness and sticking to what works for you. But also I think if, if it really gets to the point of where you don't like, feel like you can wear both hats, I think the leadership hat probably is most important right now. Yeah, I, I also have not cut down on clinical time. I happen to be at a gap between um, service. I go, I'm on backup next week and then also back on the teaching service. So um, I'm, it's my non-clinical time where I do everything else. I would say my particular challenge is just because I'm in our incident command structure and it is taking so much time. It's hard to do my day job as just the hospitalist division chief. Um, so I'm relying heavily on the other people in my division and our division um, administrator to help out a lot. Yeah, my we talked a lot about me. anxiety. Go ahead. So just my son has asked me a lot while I'm why I'm on my phone at night, and I and now now he knows the answer is uh, coronavirus. So. <laughs> So we talked a lot about anxiety in hospital medicine, um, but a, a questioner was curious how, how you're working with anxiety um, with emergency department uh, doctors. Uh, and um, I, I think Chad, you touched on this a little bit, sort of talking with the emergency department. Um, yeah, I've uh, met with but, uh, Go ahead. I've met with their chair a couple times and then actually um, we, we created a, uh, a, a a note that will print with their AVS and go home with the patient. And we actually are setting up a call tree with some physicians that their clinical duties have decreased. Or we have, um, like I have a hospitalist who is on bed rest and asking for something to do to help out. And we have a couple folks who are on quarantine. And we're going to kind of reassure patients um, that you're going to get a call from, from Nebraska Medicine. You're going to get a call from a doctor tomorrow. We're going to check on you. We think you're stable. We want to preserve these rooms for sick patients, and you know somebody's going to call. And so we created, and we're going live today with this uh, pool system and callback. And I've seen this on the SHM listserv, uh, SHMX a couple times too, where other folks are doing it. And I think it's going to give the ED a little more confidence and a little more oomph to get folks moving through. And and it it really did when I brought this idea to them. It really relieved some of their anxiety from that end because the the power of the public is 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 pretty amazing right now with what they think about this disease. Yeah, the other thing I might add is um, it, it, there is anxiety everywhere in the hospital, and I'm finding that it, especially in my incident command role this in the last couple of weeks, part of my job is just reassuring every group in every conversation that I'm a part of and addressing their fears and anxieties. Um, for example, the, our PPE task force, I meet with them every single day. And yesterday it became clear that the people on the call who don't see patients, their logistics and supply people, they were having a lot of fear and uncertainty about, you know, our mask on policy and why it doesn't pertain to non-healthcare workers and things like that. And so I find it like I'm not able to take off my leadership hat in any setting right now, including at home and with my community. Um, and that's okay, but that does mean it's important to take care of yourself first, back to the person that asked that question, because a lot is being asked of us right now as leaders. That actually dovetails perfectly to the next question, um, which I think is really top of mind um, around a lot of parts of the country. But how are you dealing with um, uh, managing your teams and the shortage of PPE? Um, so 
that's a really good question. I feel like I'm uber knowledgeable about that right now. So I've actually been writing a lot of the FAQs and the policies um, in this incident command role in the last two weeks. And so um, what we're trying to do is, as issues come up, like Chad mentioned, perioperative testing um, for asymptomatic patients and things like that, we're trying to come up with clearly worded policies and get them up onto our intranet as quickly as possible um, to sort of give people guidance. The one thing that I'll tell you is hard uh, is because people are so anxious, they just want like an algorithm and clarity about everything. Um, there's not a lot of room right now for uncertainty. And so normally our answer would be, well, use your clinical judgment. If you think it's more likely that it's COVID and you have a negative test, you still treat them as COVID. But those are really difficult right now. So we're trying to kind of protocolize things like that example as much as possible um, to just give people that support. Um, and, and the PPE decisions basically all kind of go along with that. Yeah, we're doing, I mean, we're, we are doing kind of UV irradiation of our N95s for reuse and, you know, reusing our plastic face shields um, with, uh, with good decontamination. And I agree, having step-by-step -step protocols to, I mean, everybody's intelligent around here, but having step-by-step -step protocols during a time of anxiety is extremely important. And like pictures of what you're talking yeah. about. I mean, even what's a procedure mask versus a surgical mask versus an N95, like being really clear what you're talking about for which patient population and when. Um, as for the, I think the original question it was kind of around um, the fact that it's limited supply. I mean, we have cohorted our, our team too. So we have COVID and non-COVID providers um, so that we have fewer people needing the PPE and um, can reuse supplies when that's appropriate. Yeah, us too, we stood up a COVID team and somebody referred to him as dirty and clean and I told him I don't think we should stick with that terminology. Yeah. <laughs> Great, and I think um, we'll just do one more question in the few minutes we have remaining. Um, how, how are you weighing COVID or PUI patients? Um, and so the, the questioners that indicated that they're weigh, weighing the patients as 1.5 the weight of other patients. So have you adjusted the workload when you're, or do you have plans to adjust the workload um, uh, on your providers based on whether or not they have COVID? That is a great question. Um, and. I would say this is a moving target for us, but I think the answer is we probably will. And the part of the reason is it just takes longer to care for these patients. You know, the donning and doffing takes longer. Um, we're finding we get more pushback from, you know, EKG techs and others to actually do procedures that patients need because they're in isolation. So just everything about how we deliver care seems to take longer for COVID patients, even though I wouldn't say COVID is any more complex of a disease than a lot of other things we take care of. So I think it probably does make sense to pay attention to the census on those teams and maybe adjust them differently. Um, but I, I haven't put a specific number to it. We did, and it was honestly kind of by accident in a way um so part of it is the donning and doffing i think takes a lot of time but just that communication as well and you know i covered our service the first week and i really came up due to mostly my errors on things we could do differently and so we actually put an app on the team that's doing a lot of documentation and charting and that isn't how we usually utilize our apps but we're saying let's have one provider in the room and one provider kind of manning perfect, you know, our, our pages and our phone calls and things like that. And so we, we're probably, we're probably weighting them at about one and a half now that I do the math in my head. Um, and, and so their target census is a little lower and we added some resources in much sooner than we would have because of not the complexity of the disease, but, but the complexity of caring for the patients. Yeah. 